From fake news to live streaming of suicides and even murder, Facebook has been facing questions for months about the content that appears on its pages. Documents leaked this week offered a revealing glimpse into the closely guarded secrets of how the social media giant moderates its content. Sarah T. Roberts is an assistant professor in the Department of Information Studies at UCLA and an expert in commercial content moderation. And she joins us now on the line from Los Angeles, California for more. Sarah T, good to have you back on our program. How are you doing tonight? Fine, thanks Steve, good to be here. Excellent, you have gone through these documents and I wonder if we could just start by you telling us what you found particularly noteworthy in them. Well, uh, I think what we're seeing here in these documents uh, is, is uh, things of interest at a few levels. Of course, we have now detailed information about the kinds of policies and practices that workers who are typically contracted by Facebook to do moderation must follow and undertake. So there's very specific guidelines around what kind of material can stay up and what kind can stay down. And I think the public is pretty shocked at the, uh, at the actual breadth of the kind of content that is allowed on the platform. So that's kind of the first takeaway. I think there's a second takeaway here too, though, that if we take a step back from the, the details about the specificities of the policies, what we actually have in our hands via these leaks is, uh, is a document that details Facebook's internal politics. Can we go into that a bit? Because I know last time you were on the program, you did talk to us uh, a great deal actually about how content moderation works at Facebook. Can you just remind us of, of some of the overarching themes on that? Sure. Well, uh, the, the practice of what I call commercial content moderation is the large scale organized and for pay work that people undertake all over the globe on behalf of social media platforms. And typically these people um, who can be located pretty much anywhere from Silicon Valley to Manila in the Philippines and everywhere in between um, have a lot of differences. But what they do share in, if, with regard to their work is the fact that many of them are working as contractors. So they're not full on employees of these platforms. Uh, this comes to bear not only in the fact that, as they've joked with me, they can't do things like use the climbing wall or eat the free sushi at some of these platforms, but also, especially in the case of the United States, uh, they may not have benefits that include health care. And when workers are exposed to some of the very worst proclivities of, of human nature by virtue of this work, in essence, they're looking for and then cleaning up those kinds of, uh, those kinds of depictions, having access to health care, especially mental health care, can be very important. So it's a tough job. It's relentless. Content is uploaded and, and, uh, and uh, streamed to these platforms on a 24 by 7 basis. It's, it's, it never stops. And so the work never stops to comb through the material and look for things that are objectionable, illegal, shocking, and so on. Well, I do recall last time you were here, you telling us that after looking at hour after hour after hour of this stuff, I mean, the people who do this content moderation almost develop a case of PTSD and then get discarded for somebody new. Has none of that changed in the months since you were here? You know, there are always cases of, of people who are either uh, able to do this long term and really report no ill effects, or people who do this in conditions that are relatively good. Maybe they are full on employees of the firm, maybe they're, they're well paid. But I think ultimately the outcome for somebody who does this kind of work can really go one of two ways. Either they burn out uh, because of the kind of material they see and they just kind of reach a breaking point. They either quit or they're forced to quit after a limited term employment period of maybe one or two years when they're no longer as effective at their work or they become desensitized to the work, which is what allows them to do it long term. And I'm not sure either of those things is a, is a good outcome uh, kind of uh, uh, at a social scale hmm. for any of us. Now, let me follow up on that other thing that you said during your first answer, which is you found some fascinating new developments as it related to Facebook's internal politics. What did you find there that you thought was noteworthy? Well, uh, Despite the generalized notion that platforms like Facebook ought to be an unfettered site of free speech and free expression, even a, a, a site, a new form, if you will, of participatory democracy, what these documents show is that Facebook and other platforms like it are highly regulated sites of speech. They always have been, and I've argued that for many years, but now we have the proof. Um, so Facebook really, 
develops its policies in a, in a number of ways. And in many cases, it is trying to allow the most speech that it can. In some cases, the allowance of that kind of speech is what disturbs people. So we learned from these internal policies that videos and depictions of animal abuse are widely allowed. Uh, this may come as a shock to many people. We learned that videos of abortions are allowed. Uh, a lot of times that uh, might be posted by people who are advocating for uh, restrictions on access to abortion for women, for example. So these kinds of policies that Facebook has in place actually have uh, very serious political repercussions. In other cases, Facebook engages in practices that rescind speech, and it may do this in part in order to be in a marketplace. For example, in the Turkish marketplace, Facebook has made uh, quite uh, well-known deals with that, with that government and state to disallow a lot of content there. And the people who do the disallowing of the content, in effect, are the content moderators who go in and delete posts that uh, are disallowed in Turkey. In Turkey, those, those kinds of posts that are not allowed are often political in nature. So they may support the, the Turkish wor Workers' Party, for example, which is considered by by the Turkish government to be a, I'm sorry, the Kurdish Workers' Party, which is considered by the Turkish government to be a terrorist organization. Anybody who talks about, gives a voice to, shows symbols having to do with the Kurdish Workers' Party is deleted on Facebook. And uh, Facebook has to enforce this by using this legion of worldwide workers. Let's take a step back here and just try to get a better understanding of how you now know all of this, thanks to this leak of uh, this, I guess, document dump, for lack of a better expression. How did all this stuff become public in the first place anyway? Well, I don't think The Guardian, who is the, the publisher of this material, has gone on record with, with the nature of its sources. But there have been leaks in the past, uh, probably not of this size, but similar in, in terms of content and implication. And usually what happens is that there are disgruntled workers who want the world to know both something about their working conditions and the kind of work that, that they do on behalf of these, uh, these social media platforms. Um, but there's also the other piece of them wanting people to know to the extent to which speech and activity online is mediated and moderated. And I think these documents, again, go to underscore both of those points, that these online spaces are highly regulated, highly adjudicated, the policies are generated internally, and they're opaque. Without these kinds of leaks, the public would not actually have access to these policies. But also, what these documents do is tell us something about the very difficult, unpleasant, and uh, even harmful working conditions for commercial content moderators who see the very worst of the internet over and over again. In terms of your and therefore our understanding uh, of how Facebook works, really, behind the scenes, how important would you say leaks like this are to that goal? Well, we wouldn't know much without, without the willingness of people to step forward and share this kind of material. And it's important to note um, that it's not without risk. At the very least, when people share this kind of material and they reveal the internal policies and inner workings of platforms like Facebook and others, uh, they are often risking their employment. So people who do this kind of work are almost invariably cloaked under NDAs or non-disclosure agreements as a precondition of them holding their job. This means that they're not allowed to talk about not only the kind of work that they do, but the policies that govern the work that they do that would lead to uh, people in, in the media and elsewhere, policy, et cetera, extrapolating the kinds of uh, conclusions that we are now drawing. So these people do this at great risk to their own, uh, their, their own ability to continue in their work, and they must weigh that when they approach media or when they're willing to talk to people like me, and so we, we're indebted to them for that. To your knowledge, do you know if anybody has been caught leaking and sanctioned by Facebook? Yeah, I don't know about that. Um, I imagine that Facebook is quite concerned about these leaks. Of course, Facebook's own uh, reliance on, uh, on contractors, many thousands of them around the world, uh, who operate maybe at one or two levels removed from Facebook through a series of, of contracts and outsourced labor, would make it very difficult in some cases to track down individuals. And I guess um, the fractured nature of the work in this case could serve to protect those who have decided to leak. Hmm. Uh, Sarah, you pointed out it was The Guardian that broke the story in the first place, and they also published a response, incidentally, from the head of global policy management at Facebook, someone named Monica Bickert, who had this to say. 
It's hard to judge the intent behind one post or the risk implied in another. Someone posts a graphic video of a terrorist attack. Will it inspire people to emulate the violence or speak out against it? Someone with a dark sense of humor posts a joke about suicide. Are they just being themselves or is it a cry for help? I mean, she does raise the, um, well, she raises a legitimate tricky issue about deciding, you know, what's, what's legit and what isn't. Would you grant her that? Oh, I'm sure. I have no doubt that uh, that this is a, an incredibly thorny and difficult issue for those uh, within Facebook to navigate. Uh, that's not in doubt. I think what uh, Ms. Bickert leaves out of her analysis is the extent to which uh, Facebook and other platforms like it have actually not necessarily even exacerbated an extant problem, but have created one in the sense that they have opened up uh, it, vast, powerful porter, portals of dissemination, uh, global dissemination, often instant dissemination, to people around the world and ask them to experiment as they will with those tools. So what we've seen in recent weeks that has uh, prompted a great deal of public outcry is uh, people around the world picking up this new Facebook Live tool, which is almost impossible to moderate, hmm. and use use it to, uh, to record some of the most heinous human acts that we can imagine, including the murder of a child and a suicide. Uh, so uh, yes, she's right that it's difficult to gauge intent, but I think we also must ask questions about what is Facebook's intent of continually offering tools to the public without having fu fully and adequately accounted for the worst kind of uptake that that may be uh, may be a result of them. No, absolutely fair enough, and I'm not sure there's any justification anyone could ever come up with saying it's acceptable to, to put on Facebook Live the killing of a child. No. Uh, so I mean, we we can all agree on that. But of course, short of that, there are lots of things that lots of people would disagree about. And I'm wondering if you are, can you offer us, in your view, some clear advice today on where you think Facebook ought to be drawing that line between respecting free speech and at the same time protecting us from stuff that is truly disgusting and harmful. Well, I think Facebook's main issue here is one of transparency versus opacity. And where it's really running into difficulty is the fact that it has, on, on a longstanding basis, refused to acknowledge its moderation practices and when kind of caught uh, in the act of, of participating in those moderation practices, it's really refused to discuss them publicly and openly. And that leads to a situation of, uh, at the very least, mistrust on the part of the public. A mistrust, misunderstanding of what's going on, um, a notion that there may be uh, different kinds of applications of rules depending on where one is in the world and so on. So I think it's unlikely that Facebook is, is going to be able to extract itself from this difficult situation of needing to control uh, the content that flows on its platforms. And of course, we must remember that although we're talking about free speech, Facebook is a private company uh, with shareholders, so it's publicly traded in that sense, but it's not uh, a part of the public good. It's not a governmental agency. It doesn't exist in a commons. Um, it's actually a for-profit endeavor. And so Facebook, in essence, is going to be governed by its own need and desire to generate revenue. So uh, that's always going to be a driving force and principle here. And free speech is always going to be weighed against that principle and driving force when Facebook meets out its practices. But I think the other aspect here is that the, the public has, has a desire to know more about the practices that govern its own interactions and its own participation on these social media platforms, which at the end of the day is the lifeblood and essence of Facebook. If Facebook can't operate if you or I aren't on there generating new content endlessly and having a, keeping an interesting flow for other users to come back and engage with. And so I think this issue of transparency versus, versus opacity with regard to its practices will become more important as users demand more information about what exactly is going on behind the scenes. Facebook could do itself a favor by figuring out how to be more open and honest with its user base and maybe even engage in dialogue with its user base around these issues. But so far, it's been very much a top-down and closed kind of uh, system. Uh, okay, I hear you and I respect what you say, but but the real I think the reality is that Facebook, the, the equation you just laid out, which is that Facebook is a private company that balances uh, its desire for as much free speech as possible with its business um, requirements, uh, I mean, you could say that about the New York Times or the Washington Post as well, right? They're operating under the same uh, realities of the free marketplace as well. Isn't that fair to say? 
It's absolutely fair to say. And here's where we get into another issue with Facebook and with social media platforms. Um, they have largely been able to self-define. Uh, if, you, if you look through news reports and other reports, uh, these, these firms will go on record uh, touting themselves as tech companies. And they've often eschewed labels like media platforms, certainly news platforms. Um, I think it, it's not just simply kind of an existential or s semantic debate. I think there's actually some, some, uh, there's some deep meaning in uh, why they might uh, go for one of these labels versus another. So you kind of give the example of a, of a news media outlet, a newspaper, a, a, a news channel, and so on. Typically, in those kinds of contexts, when the public wants to know something about editorial practices, which is really what we're talking about with mo moderation by another name, the public can open up that page uh, in the newspaper that lists the editorial board, that gives um, information about editorial practices, that offers a means to connect or communicate with, with the outlet um, if there are questions or concerns about how those practices are undertaken. That does not exist as such for something like Facebook because Facebook doesn't see itself uh, as, as, a, as a media outlet in that traditional sense, and therefore it has largely been able to escape the public demand for that kind of engagement with the platform. I think we're at a moment of a tipping point, however, where the public is pushing back and saying it's going to demand more of that kind of engagement from Facebook with the user base. And that's the, that's the kind of uh, uh, moment of opportunity that I hope the platform will seize upon and rather than sort of close the door on. Well, how about this? Do they get kudos from you for hiring those 3,000 new reviewers who are presumably going to moderate content? And, uh, well, I, I won't presume to prejudge it. Let me ask you, what impact do you think that'll have? Well, uh, from what I know about the, the kind of uh, experience of, of work life for commercial content moderators, I'm concerned, firstly, uh, for those workers and their well-being and, and their their what kind of training they might have as they quickly ramp up to uh, respond to Facebook's need for this kind of work. I also think that um, although we're seeing, a, in essence, a doubling of the workforce that uh, Facebook acknowledges, so it said previously it had about 4,500 workers doing this work worldwide, and now it says it's going to add another 3,000 for a total of 7,500. If we look at that against the, the incredible number of users on the platform and the amount of content it's generated, 7,000 uh, vis-a-vis the uh, billion plus uh, users who are on the platform is really a drop in the bucket. So I think Facebook is still uh, in danger of yet another horrible uh, incident that could happen at any time. And it's going to be difficult for it to uh, be nimble enough to respond uh, to those kinds of situations, even mm -hmm. with this, the addition of this workforce. It's oh, a challenge. Okay, Sarah T, let's finish up on this. Uh, we appreciate the fact that you would like to see this company be more transparent and more accountable to its users. Uh, they have heard the criticisms. Uh, do you think that, um, do you think that their future looks more transparent and more accountable as a result of the criticisms they've now faced? I'm not so sure that they're leaning in that direction. Uh, the Guardian, I know, offered uh, Facebook a chance to respond to the leaks and to the documents it had, and you read uh, some of the feedback from from uh, one of their their policy leaders within the firm and other press releases that have been that have been uh, disseminated around the incidents that we've referenced in this interview, and over the past few weeks have also been fairly vague and fairly closed in terms of. Uh, indicating that it that it intends to uh, open up a dialogue with the public, with policymakers, or with people like me. So I'm not so sure that it's actually hearing the message that in addition to dealing with the, the first order problem of uh, the kind of content that is uh, being uploaded to its platforms and circulated, but um, the secondary issue of the public's response to that and the public's concern about these uh, opaque policies, I'm not sure it's hearing that um, more di dialogue is the way to go. And I'm not sure even if it does hear that, that it feels it can respond to that without opening up essentially a huge Pandora's box of other issues. Hmm. Sarah T. Roberts from UCLA, we always appreciate it when you take our calls and join us on TVO. So thanks again. Thank you, Steve. I appreciate it. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit TVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.